So then, in the thick of play itself, you can see if you follow that little arrow, there's all these terms there, and there are all these things you recognize. There's resolution, there's numbers, there's character sheets, there's, you know, the instrumentation of play, right? I mean, I got a, I got a whole bunch of it right there. So yeah. we, 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 have, we have instrumentation of play. Well, I don't know about you, but there have been times when I have been very excited by the color that's been presented to me. And then when we sit down and get going and playing, um, the instrumentation itself seems to work against it or seems irrelevant so that we're like really spinning our wheels with checking this number against that number. And it's not right. helping me keep the color going. Right. So I totally understand yeah. that. Now, this has led a number of people to think that those are dichotomous, that there's all the imagination and role playing over here, and there's all the numbers and dice over there. And I don't buy that. Okay. I'm just letting you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take that point of view. The question to me is we gotta look at when the situation changes. When we are at the end of or toward the end of, or at least done with a session of our Call of Cthulhu play, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to look and we're going to see that the fiction has changed. One or more of us may be dead. One or more of us may be insane or, you know, neurotic in some fashion. Um, many of us have changed in our skills. We may have acquired new skills like, uh, like, like mythos, right? Lore of the mm -hmm. mythos lore that we didn't have before. Um, and you can look at those changes on the sheet and you can look at the changes in pure fictional terms, but the character looks different, right? The newspaper man who was hip and flip and ready for a scoop was almost kind of looking forward to admitting, semi admitting in print that he had participated in the exhuming of a grave, you know, for edgy mm -hmm. purposes, real yellow journalism, right? 1920s, he's working for a Hearst paper. This is awesome, right? He's going to be, you know, it's, it's real edgy. It's real. It's it's uh, it's kind of shitty, and there's a scandal. Maybe you know this is going to be awesome. Well, so he's hip and flip, and you can all imagine him with a pencil stuck behind his ear, you know, and wisecracking and stuff in the beginning of play. <laughs> Whereas at the end of this session, this is a guy who had actually liked the guy who had been dragged off by the ghoul and had tried to pull him away from the ghoul and come away with his leg at the knee down, and that's all he got away from the ghoul, right? and went through his sanity checks and got some, you know, mythos, and now is a really different guy. He's a different guy. He's got a different idea about what he wants to expose to the world in the paper. Mm -hmm. And God knows, we know his editors aren't going to go for it, right? He's just crazy as far as they're concerned. Um, and But, mm -hmm. you know, when he, as far as, like, investigating the next step, he's going to be, like, totally all about this. I mean, you can just look at him, and he looks different. The character looks different in your mind now. See what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And the nature of the whole situation is different now because our characters are now one step into madness and one step into knowledge when they weren't before. And they all know they're going to come to some kind of fate or another eventually. So we have a whole different, you know, feel. The, the color has changed. See what I mean? Right. Both in yeah, details yeah. and in substance. And if we look at that for any role-playing situation, and we're going we're gonna to throw out that body of games at the moment for which no such change really occurs. There are some which just bloat, right? You get more hit points and the, damage, and the monsters get bigger and the weapons get bigger, but really it's just the same. It just bloats, right? It doesn't really change. Right. But we're going to set that aside. We're going to say we're looking at things where things change. And even like even real traditional fantasy games, you have that. Imagine, you know, your first level wizard and your tenth level wizard that you genuinely took up through those. Mm -hmm. You got a buddy who's an artist in the game, and he drew like the the pack of you in the beginning. And right mm -hmm. about this point, he goes, "Wow, you know, your wizard needs a new pick." And he does it up, and he's like lived and breathed your wizard's ups and downs, you know, the whole time, just like you did with his character. And he nails it. This is your 10th level wizard, and you can see the scar that he got that, that one time, right? 
And right. you look at it and you're like, wow, that's him. Thanks, Bob. This is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a piece of your life now. Right. right. So that's the same thing that we're talking about with, with your game. Think about a few iterations of those systemic features in action. Tell me what my guy looks like a ways down the road. And not just my guy, but the things he does, the situation he might be in. Is he advanced? Well, is, is he um, the leader of the of the tribe now, of the clan, for example? Well, I, I think uh, the question will come down to um, when you're playing your character, how... How much are you willing to risk? Are you, right. you going to, are you trying to preserve who the person is, or are you willing to sacrifice who he is to get what you want? I totally get that with the mechanics you already alluded to. Let's say you pick for purposes of our conversation right now, pretend that we're sort of a co-mind, right? One person playing this character, mm -hmm. not just me and you and, um, and make that decision in the long term, right? It could have wiggled right during play but let's say right. you, you've decided which way it's leaned through the multiple things that we've done now pick one and tell me what he looks like and what kind of situations he may be in. well um let's say that this guy he cares most about um proving himself mm -hmm. to his people and rising up and he has this desire for power so as he gets these choices, as the game goes on, he is willing to do darker things. Right. So he indulges and, the vices. You've, you've classified right. a few of the paths and things as vices. So right, right. you've been doing that. Go on. Right. So then um, he begins to change, or at least his story does, and, and, and the player would choose which path he goes down. Does he go down a, a darkness path, he's more demonic-like? Does he go down like a, a path to despair where it's not really him, but bad things happen to him. People die right, around right, him. Right, he loses right. his thing. Uh, or does he personally change? Does he become right. angrier and right. darker and these things? So, um, you know, so what I would hope to see is the harder you push, the darker you are. Right. And so also the, the fact that local fictional, can I, if I can extrapolate, that the local fictional outcomes of each situation can go one way or the other. So sometimes you might look back on a situation and say, yeah, I went dark, but the ultimate outcome I'm good with. Right. right. In other words, there's, there's flexibility to what actually happens so that you end up not with a boring morality tale, but with a pretty good look at, you know, the, the imperfect relationship between intentions and outcomes. Exactly. One of one of my friends loves to, yeah. Where he he will do a, a couple of really dirty things just to jump ahead, right? You know, and then then he'll try to reevaluate rationally, right? Right. Let the character like deal with the darkness that he's done. The idea he's that done. the characters continue. This is actually an important feature. Let me start over. I battled. Okay. okay. In a lot of games that have for lack of a better word, morality mechanics. Um, a lot of them try to do what you're doing, which is to not... You see, the thing is, you can't dictate decisions uh, for the players and have like a really fixed morality mechanic. A good example is the death spiral. Uh, in the very first Cyberpunk, you had your uh, humanity and um or the equivalent and the point was is that it dropped as you got more cyberware mm -hmm. but as it dropped the character's scope for moral action narrowed so the problem with that is that it's a one-way ticket and your character gets less interesting to play as they drop rather than right. more interesting and so well, what did let's go ahead yeah, one of the things that disappoint me in games with these kinds of things is where there's a set rule and it says this is good and this is bad. Right. And right. I've always hated that um, because I want to explore morality. Right. I want to, you know, I, I want to, I want morality to, to be gray and I want there to be rational. Right. And 
I so I I I, I always you know I, when I envision this, I wanted to black and white. Yeah. As far as 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 a DM to what's right, right, or, right. Or, or the game itself. Now the uh, uh, the the way that I manage this in Sorcerer, um, which is pretty ambitious in some ways, but two of the features that matter most is one decreased humanity in Sorcerer does not change the character's scope for action. That's one thing. So another thing about it is that the uh, that as I mentioned before, and as you confirmed, the actual outcome of scenarios and situations is what it is through play, and therefore its precise correspondence to the goodness or badness of a given action is not perfect, right? We don't live, right. as you say, and, and what, what you're calling black and white, I would choose to articulate as over-aligning intentions and outcomes, Right, so the good intentions make good outcomes, and vice versa. Um, and and so if you decouple those, so that you know the the actions can be judged. Right, you say. I mean, the player does so. They say, "I'm using my vice." Right, so the player is just taking care of that side of it already. Then the point, though, is that how it actually plays out in the scenario. Well, I guess we're going to find out, and and that creates an existential effect rather than yeah. this aligned intentions equal outcome effect. And so um so yeah, I mean I'm I'm I really get what you're saying and and this is an important <laughs> quality. Um the thing I was focusing on just for the moment was and I think if I'm reading you right or hearing you right um is that let's say my character is quite for lack of a better word vicey you know, in this in, in in this this long series of events, it still means that the next thing that comes up, I have full scope over whether to do it again. Right. That's that's huge, actually. It seems like such a simple thing, but if you think about the game impact of the converse, you'll realize it's not simple at all. Right. right. So I understand, yeah. yeah. So cool. All right, all right. I'm getting a pretty good idea from from here.